Herr Rohit Talwar. Welcome and the floor is yours. Thank you. I think I know what our chair just said, but I have no clue. Um, okay, so what am I going to do with you? My job is that I spend my time with my team looking at the future of different industries, and in particular, we specialize in looking at the future of travel and tourism, the future of airports, the future of airlines, and we're running the biggest study in the world at the moment on the future of the meetings and conferences industry. So I'm going to share bits of all of that with you today. Uh, you will get a copy of the slides you see on the screen. I think you have those in your notes. If you want the other materials I refer to, if you want the other research, just send me an email or give me your card, and we'll very happily share all of that other material with you if, if you think it would be helpful. Uh, I, where I want to start, really, is, is, is to draw on some of our experience around the world. When we look at the future, uh, as I travel around the world and talk to different countries, we work with a lot of tourism boards, airports, convention centers around the world. What's fascinating is, is how people are looking at the future and how they're preparing. And one of the biggest challenges everyone faces is how do we make what we are doing sustainable? Not just environmentally sustainable, not just socially sustainable, but most importantly, financially sustainable. So when we have investment money, like you have money from the European Union, do we repeat the Soviet era mistakes of building these large palaces, these large edifices, and then spending the next 20 years wondering how we're going to fill them and how we're going to finance them. And, and I spend an awful lot of my time getting my shoulder wet because I sit with the CEOs of convention centers and giant five-star hotels and giant museums who had the money to build their property but now don't have any money to market it, don't have any money to keep it up to date and they can't fill it. And they didn't understand the rules of the game for what they're getting into. Uh, and I'll talk a bit more about that. But today, if you, for example, everyone is saying you guys should build a big convention center here. What I would suggest you do is go and have a look at Reykjavik. Reykjavik have a beautiful convention center. You could put most of the population of Reykjavik inside there and still not notice them. Their problem is, they can't fill it. It is an expensive white elephant. And they didn't understand how the meetings industry works. Because the bigger the meeting you try to attract, the more power the meeting owner has. And the more they want from you. If I have an event which has 500 people or 1,000 people and I'm an association, I don't even ask about your facilities. The first question I ask is, how much are you going to pay me to come to your city? Can I have your convention center for free? What else will you give me? So investing in a huge property like that might seem like a good idea, but it will be expensive. There will be a lot of argument about it. Everyone will pin their hopes on it. And then the real challenge will come in how you bring businesses to it, bring events to it. Will you want to put up 250,000 euros to bring the diabetes conference? Who will pay for that? These are real challenges we face. And, and what people don't understand when they make some of these decisions is what's happening and how the industries are changing. They look backwards. They look at what happened in the past and assume that the future will be just like the past. They don't take account of what's happening now. And what we think is you really have to change your mindset now. You have to look at using the investment money you have in very sustainable ways. That means investing in training, in capability, in getting people to think in smart, flexible facilities that can be built quickly, that are adaptable, that are movable. And I'll show you some examples of what I'm talking about. But things that really help you move forward but don't require a huge amount of ongoing investment from government to keep them going. You just have to look around Europe today at the number of airports, buildings, hotels, convention centers that will close because the local government has no money anymore. 
and can't keep funding them and can't keep subsidising. If you, you've been very successful, you're one of the few countries in Europe that's growing, that isn't growing its budget surplus, that is staying within the European stability rules. You don't want to break that. You actually want to say, how do we use our money in a sustainable way that helps the industry become self-sufficient rather than building a dependency culture? That's where I would start. That's how you make sure the future works. You make sure that it's sustainable because the most sustainable things you have to build on are ideas, people, and relationships. Those are the things that don't require money. And if you can drive those, then you can drive growth. What I'm going to share with you as well is, is a variety of different pieces of research. One is a study we did recently looking at where branded hotels were going, what are their strategies, uh, how do they grow, grow for the future. But really what I want to share from you from that are some of the things about future customers and their behaviours. Uh, we also know that the world around us is changing quite dramatically. What we took for granted five years ago or even two years ago is no longer true. We heard a lot of statistics this morning. But two very, very startling statistics for me. One, are, one is that today, the rich countries of the world have a debt that is more than 100% of their GDP. So they owe more than they make every year. Second is that the size of derivatives contracts out there, these complex contracts we've let the banks create in the financial world, are now worth... $700 trillion, which means they are worth 10 times the size of the global economy. Which is why when the G20 leaders get together now, they have no idea how to deal with it. The only decision they now make when they meet is whether they should have prawns or chicken for lunch. Absolutely nothing else can they move forward on. We also know that we're in a situation where we don't know how to play forward on this. If you take the European Union, uh, the, the Eurozone model is a fair weather model. It was designed for when things were going well. There was no exit door. We had no plan for what happens if someone does a grease and tries to borrow their way to greatness. So there's no way out, which is why we have this panic. It was also based on, well, do you know what the principal design model of the Eurozone is? the student bar at university. I don't know if any of you remember, but you used to go into the bar together as a group of friends, but by the time you got to the bar to pay for the drinks, somehow everyone else had disappeared and there was only one person left. And that person's Germany. And Germany are fed up paying for everyone else's bar bill. And as we heard today, their incomes are going down in real terms. So we're gonna have to have a different model Everywhere around Europe, that centrally funded, government funded, EU funded model is going to come under real pressure. You know, people are talking to me today about the volume of EU funding they expect to get. Built into that is an assumption that the European Union will survive in its current form. What if it doesn't? I would want a sustainable model that meant we could survive using what money we have right now from the EU, but on a baseline assumption that we got nothing else next year or going forward. Because if you can build something that works that way, it's sustainable. Then if you get more money, great. But otherwise, what you're doing is building an industry that really is sustainable. What we also know is that everything we're trying to do, the plans we're trying to create, the way we're trying to market ourselves, the way we're trying to recruit people, is all being challenged by a change in our behaviours. And the big change in our behaviours is that our attention span has disappeared. If you took someone on the 1st of January 2000, they would remember a world and took them away from the planet and brought them back today, they would see that the world has changed. They still remember a world where you wrote reports to get your message across. Since then, we dropped reports down to memos that were shorter, but even they were too long. So then we started to send email messages. Even they were too long. Then we started to send SMS messages, but even those are too long. Now we're down to 140 character Twitter postings. That's how you get someone's attention now, is in 140 characters. How do you get people talking about you? If you have teenage kids, you know that they've managed to reduce the communication to baby down to two characters, which is a smile and a grunt. 
But what we, what we really have to understand is, is the people we're trying to communicate to, whether they're potential customers, potential employees, partners or investors, are no longer listening for long periods. We've got to find smart ways of getting our message across to those people so they will start talking about us. That's the way to grow your profile. That's the way to get people talking. And to understand that, you really, you know, my, for me, the best training course in that is my 16-year-old daughter. I sit, I, I watch her at home. Uh, she's watching a film on TV. She's also reading a magazine. She has her iPod in, listening to music. She has her Blackberry. She's BBMing her friends. There's a buzz every two minutes, two, or maybe 30 seconds if there's something good on the film, because they're watching it together but separately. She's SMSing. She doesn't talk on the phone, because only old people like her parents do that. <laughs> and she's got her laptop, and she's working on her laptop. And I say to her, what are you doing? Now remember, she's 16, therefore genetically I must be wrong. Uh, you're allowed to laugh if you like. But, um, uh, you know, by definition, I'm wrong. And, and I, she looks at me, and she says, homework. Now, I can either be upset and say, you shouldn't do it that way, but then I look at her results at school and she does far better than I ever did. The child's brilliant. So my challenge is to understand how this alien operates, to understand the operating system of this new unit that has arrived in my life, but it's taken 16 years for me to realize it. And that's a real challenge for all of us because what we're trying to do, the models, the plans I hear for people, are great plans if this was 1980 or 1990, but we're moving into the 20s. Now, we're, we're moving into the teens. We need a different model for how we do things, how we communicate, and how we explain our strategies. So let's move on. We also know that people no longer expect to wait for everything. They can configure the world how they want it. For example, their mobile phone through apps. I can do what I want now. I can change the world. My view of the world is guided by my apps. Uh, we also know that what's coming, technology is going to change my view again. If I, today I can buy a mobile phone from LG, which has a 3D display on it, I can see images on it in three dimensions without using glasses. Now, I'm seeing some interesting things coming from hoteliers who are saying, actually, we'll let you look at your hotel room on the phone. A neat way of showing what we have. It's very low cost to develop, but it's a way of communicating to a particular group who might be interested in that. Holographic laptops will come. Technology will keep moving faster and faster. I'm not saying you should invest in it, but you need to understand that that's what ha what's happening. That's what's shaping the views of the world around us. One of the big things that's also happening is everyone wants things personalized to them. They want a personal experience. They want stories they can tell. They want unique, one-off experiences. I can think of no better place to do that, actually, than Estonia. You can create, on a continuous basis, one-off trips that, are never, that will never be sold again. I'll talk more about that later. But that's what people want. That's more and more what they want. But also, the manufacturing technology is moving to enable us to do that now. I can buy a $5,000 3D printer now. 3D printers print objects in three dimensions. I'm oh, sorry, it's not showing there. Literally, you can see those objects. You can print plates. You can print jewelry. jewelry. Literally, you print it up layer by layer. You, you can print things that you can't manufacture any other way. Hotels are investing in these things. So they say, when you come, have your wedding here. Design what your crockery looks like. We will print that crockery for you. And then you can give it to the guests when they leave as a unique souvenir. And they'll never have something like that again because we won't print the same thing for someone else. That's personalization, that's storytelling. And you can buy this technology now for less than $5,000. It is a way of completely differentiating your experience. We also know that we've heard a lot already about Asia this morning. We've heard about the growth of Asia, but we really need to put it in context. If this was the world at the end of last year, 60% was in Asia. What we know is that in the last 30 years, China has taken more than 450 million people out of poverty. India's taken about 200 million out. That story is being repeated across the developing world. But what's really interesting is what happens next. We see that Africa and the Middle East grow by about a billion, but Asia grows by more than the whole population of Europe and North America combined. 
which is one of the reasons why people talk about this being the Asian century, because wealth, opportunity, innovation is all shifting to that part of the world. And your challenge is twofold. One is, you know, for a lot of uh, businesses here, it's about attacking those markets to win customers from them, but it's also recognizing that competition could come from there. Uh, I, I, and I'll come back on some strategies for the airport and the airline that tap into that. And just you know, looking at the demographic story, what we see is there are some big changes. One of the most badly served markets around are the over 60s. The over 60s have more than half of the wealth in almost every country. And women over 60 tend to, on average, have between 65 and 75 percent of all that wealth. So for the guys in the room who are worried about the size of your pension fund, just start dating widows. Uh, but this is a group that's growing and very badly served. People do not cater for them. When they travel, quite often they'll take their grandkids, they'll take their families. That group are the ones who want unique cultural experiences more than anything. They want to relax. They don't want to go to a hotel and they don't know whether they're in Belgrade, Bucharest or Boston. They want something that feels unique to the local destination. They want an experience that they can tell stories about. Because by the time I've got 65, I don't need any more material goods. I don't need to have the same experience everywhere I go. What I want is something unique, something that I'll remember, something that actually I feel has enriched my life. Uh, and you know, we've heard about the middle class. All of these are, are huge opportunities for us. But we only have to go after a tiny fraction. Also within that group, what we've got to understand is they're not going away. If you're under 50 today in a developed economy, the chances are you're going, there's a 90% chance you'll live to 100. If you're over 50, forget it. Uh, but there's a 90% chance as well that our kids will live to 120. And then there's research that's going on on aging that says, actually, uh, we've mapped the human genome, we understand our genetic structure, now let's look at the building blocks of our genes, which are called proteins. And we do a lot of research on a worm called the nematode worm because it has a similar protein structure to humans. In that worm, they found a protein that controls aging. When you stop that protein functioning, you extend the life of the worm by three to five times. They think they found that same protein in humans. How do you motivate a 190-year-old hotel manager? <laughs> what do you buy your front desk reception ma receptionist for her 200th birthday? <laughs> and think about marriage. <laughs> you know, some of us struggle with the idea of a deal that lasts 60 years. Imagine making the commitment and it bonding you together for 140 plus. Would we make divorce compulsory after 30 years just to keep the murder rate down? <laughs> We're entering into a fascinating world, and, and, and the, the point here is that we need to understand this world. We need to understand what's changing, what's shaping it, so that the solutions we develop are sustainable for the world we're moving into. We've heard a lot about the Asian traveler, and they're going to account for a huge chunk of spending. My question to you is, you are 0.04% of total GDP. How many visitors did you have from overseas last year? One point, anyone give me the exact number? Tourism people, please. I can tell you, but I want you to tell me. I know the number. One point, one point six, two. The guy from the airport obviously expands it. Two million, one point six over here. Okay. Last year, exactly 2.12. 2.12. So 2.12 million out of a global population of nearly 7 billion. So we're not looking for a lot of people. The question is, do we really want to go after these markets where we don't understand the culture, we don't understand the language, we don't understand what first-time travellers from these markets really want, and are they really going to come to Estonia first? Or do we want to market to people based on the experiences they're looking for, the stories they want, wherever they come from? If they happen to come from China, great. But rather than running a big China ad campaign or a Russia campaign, should we be marketing what you can do here and the experiences people have had here and attract those who are interested. Does anyone know how eBay was founded? 
eBay was founded by a guy with a broken light pointer. You know the things you point at the screen? He had one of these that was broken, but he thought, let me see if I can sell it. So he put it on the internet on a discussion forum and just said, I'm selling a broken light pointer. Nine people wrote to him and said, can we buy your broken light pointer? The guy who offered the most money, he went back to him and said, why did you buy your broken, the broken light pointer from me? And the guy said, because I collect broken light pointers. <laughs> Suddenly, eBay was born. Because what he realized is that there are markets for everything. There are communities for everything in this world. You have a road museum here. Yeah? All around the world, there are people interested in roads. There are road associations. I've spoken to a road association in the US with 1,000 delegates. But there are people who worked on roads, whose hobby is to look at roads, count roads, measure roads, smell roads, you know, eat roads, whatever. You have things that can appeal to people out there. It's about being smart and reaching them, and social media lets you get to them. So rather than having big, expensive campaigns that target countries that are unsustainable, because as soon as you stop advertising, they stop coming, talk about engaging with people, bringing hotels, museums, partners, what you have together to go and pitch to the communities. And make yourselves part of that community because of what you have. If you look at Davos, Davos is one of the hardest places on earth to reach. Yeah? It's about as difficult to get to as Estonia. Has less direct flights. Yet is one of the most popular conference and holiday destinations in Europe. People don't care about the fact that it's hard to get to. It's got a brand image they want to go to because of the experience they can have. Don't let these things become excuses. We don't have direct flights. We don't have this. We know this isn't there. We haven't got the right marketing campaign in Azerbaijan. Forget it. It's about how you get the story across, and you're going to hear a lot more later about how to do this. And this is where I think it's about unleashing the imagination and giving yourselves permission to use your own ideas not to wait for government, not to wait for the tourism ministry, not to wait for the tourism board to drive it. And we know, you know, the age and middle class are going to be huge, but do you want them? You know, what we know is that the most expensive groups to serve are the Russians, the Indians, and the French. The cheapest groups to serve are the Swiss and the Japanese, because they leave the hotel room cleaner than when they arrived. People need to understand this, the cost of servicing. Be careful what you wish for. Who do you really want to have? Uh, we also know that you know, the, the world is changing. Some of the behaviors that came out of our study. The one is this group who are just so busy, their life is so pressurized, they don't really care about giving you feedback, telling you what they want. They just hope you'll get it right. And if you don't, they'll move on. They won't even tell you why. But there's a kind of growing group that are like that. You see them in restaurants, you see them all over the place. Some people like to call them Americans. Uh, there's a second group who have very complex lives. Their incomes have really gone down. They no longer can afford a cleaner. All of the elder care they're doing themselves. More and more of the things in their lives they're having to do themselves. They can take shorter holidays because they don't want to be away from work too long. So when they come traveling, their expectations are huge. They've only got five days, and they want every day to be perfect. If you get one day wrong, you make a mistake, and you don't fix it quickly, you've ruined 20% of their annual holiday. So they have a different set of expectations. Then there's another group who are saying, actually, I spend my entire life plugged into technology. I'm, you know, four phones, emails, everything. I'm just online all the time. What I want to do is unplug. I just want a simple, back to nature or relaxed, unstressed environment. Your challenge is to take stress away from me and my experience. So I decompress and I re-energize. And then there's a the fourth group who are really interesting because they're very wealthy but almost impossible to please. So these are the people who will go and stay in the Leela Palace in Delhi because their friends have stayed there. They're paying $5,000 a night. But because their friend had the guy make coffee for them to exactly the way they wanted it, with the coffee bean they wanted from Colombia, especially shipped in for them, the next guy that comes, that won't be good enough. He needs a better story than his friend. He needs the guy to have telepathically worked out which coffee bean he wants and have it ready for him. 
So, you know, we, we're understanding that the markets are becoming harder to segment, behaviours are becoming more complicated. What won't go away is the pressure for sustainability. Uh, in our research, what we see is that 82% basically say sustainability will be a critical decision factor when they, choose, they do. And what we're seeing is people are really getting their heads around this now and building very interesting propositions. The one I like best is over in Copenhagen. This is a, a completely eco-neutral hotel. In fact, it actually generates electricity for the grid in Copenhagen. Covered in solar panels, a thermal well in the basement. If you go to the gym and you spend time in the gym, you generate electricity. They give you back a voucher for like 36 euros to go and spend in the restaurant based on the energy you've generated. <laughs> you get paid for exercising and being, you know. It's an interesting story. Bizarrely, they do not market themselves as a venue for eco-conferences and green conferences. They never even thought about it. They'd never made that connection. But actually, it's a perfect place to go. If I'm into eco or green, that's where I would go. We also know that technology is going to be central to what people want. Uh, two interesting things for me. Um, one is, in that group coming through, there are people who would much rather stay at home and play their computer games and live in their virtual world than travel because the virtual world offers a richer experience than the real one. Now, for parents, that's a challenge. If their teenage kids are like that, some of us have to think about how do we cater for that. So what we're seeing is more and more hotels actually saying, you know, tell us when you come what video games your kids like to play and we'll get an even better console for them or we'll give them the chance to play something even cooler so you can have an attraction for them. The other thing that's going to happen more and more is the amount of information we'll have with us about who we are and, and it's a choice as to how we use it. Today, uh, I can already get my genetic profile. I can go to a website called 23andMe. I can send them my saliva. saliva. Eight weeks later, I get back my profile. It tells me things like how long I'm going to live, what I might be allergic to, what diseases I might catch. People, over the next few years, that will be on your mobile phone. I will expect when I go into a supermarket, I've seen the experiments already, I'll wave my phone over the food and it will say, Rohit, put that back, you're diabetic. It's got sugar in. And, when I, and because I'll be able to pay just by waving my phone, wave and pay, I mean, I can already do that in the Czech Republic, I won't be allowed to pay for that item when I get to the checkout. It will refuse to accept that item. Now think about hotels and how they cater for customers and customers providing that genetic information. Well, we want to do that. Uh, what we also know is that customers, because we can form into special interest groups now, will define our own propositions. We'll say, look, we're a group of people who are interested in uh, leather sandals manufactured in Sweden between two, 1977 and 1979. Who is going to offer us the best holiday experience built around that? And by the way, there are 500 of us, or 30 of us. And reverse auction it. So rather than you put your offer up on the internet, they will reverse auction their demand, which is great, because you can start to tailor and create packages. And what we see is that 90% think that's going to happen, what that means is that people are going to have to develop very good social listening skills, and you're going to hear more later again about using the social media to really drive your proposition. We also know the hotel categorization is changing. Uh, in Jordan now, the star rating system is not based on, on swimming pools and whether you have weighing scales in the room. It's based on shock horror, the quality of the guest experience because you can stay in a five-star hotel or a five-star hotel. We know there's very big differences. But actually ranking them based on the quality of their guest experience, ranking them based on what's said on TripAdvisor by guests changes the whole story. The UK is building those rankings in as well to its rating system. How many of you here who have a hotel ask your customers to write a review on TripAdvisor while they're still there, just before they leave at checkout? Give one here. Give them a cup of coffee, ask them to do a review on that. If they've, if they've come for an adventure holiday, they've been bog shoeing, get them to write on their adventure site. It is the most powerful piece of marketing you can have done, word of mouth. Very simple to do, requires no government input. It's something that's about you saying, I give myself permission to succeed. 
Uh, we also know that it's going to be harder and harder to fragment people into segments and to say, this is the segment we're going after. You know, 25 to 35-year-old Russians who have this lifestyle. We won't be able to do that. We'll be talking more about people who have an interest in this, people who want to come for a holiday to do that. We'll be focusing much more on the experience we can offer and who they are rather than where they're from or how much they earn or what country they live in. And what we see is over 70% think that. People will also expect that personalization. Today I can choose which seat I sit in on the plane, I can choose which food I have if I fly with Delta Airlines, I can choose and personalize my experience. But when I go to a hotel, they tell me where I've got to stay, they tell me what's going to be in my hotel room, I can't normally choose the sheets, the linen, if I don't want to use the TV, I still have to pay for it. Technology is going to increasingly allow us to know what's been used and to enable people to say, here's what I want in my room. And I'll pay, for, you know, I'll pay for the basics and then I'll pay for each extra. That personalization is what people, 92% think that's going to be likely. And literally, people think that we'll be able to personalize almost every aspect of the, of the experience. The great thing is for a small country, it's a lot easier to do that personalization. It's a lot easier to have that conversation, to pick up the phone once they made the booking and then personalize the experience. That's the story that you want people to say, that after I booked, they called me up and let me talk, talk to me about which bed I could have, did I want a TV, what food did I want in the minibar, all that kind of stuff. Five minute call, five year impact in terms of them telling that story. Uh, we also know that at every price point, wherever you are, people want that personalization option. 92% said they want that. And you know, we know that to deliver that, it's not just about technology. Most of it is in here. Most of it is about tra staff trained to think that way around personalization. 93% agree with that. So, let's think about Estonia then. Where do you sit? You've done well. Good success record in tourism. You're performing well competitively, as we've heard, relative to a lot of the other destinations in Europe. You have a very distinctive proposition. You may not want to talk about what you've got, but actually you have some very distinctive propositions. And I'm not talking about British stag weekends coming here or people saying that it's got cheap booze and you know, beautiful women and actually not worried about the culture. Yes, it's got beautiful women, fantastic, but what beyond that? What is the sustainable story? And I think you've got some great things on offer. Uh, for example, you've got the cruise industry. But only 10% of the people, 7 million plus, who, who pass through Tallinn come in. It would seem to me one of the most obvious things to do is to be marketing through those groups to spend a little bit more time in Tallinn, to build into that experience. Or to, you know, using the airline, partner with the cruise lines to say, actually, why don't you start your journey in Tallinn, fly into here and then cruise from here. Building on what you've got, that's not requiring anything new to be developed, it's tying into what you've got. You've already got these people, these customers. It's like having a shopping centre, but most of them walking in one door and out the other and never actually going into any of the shops. Why would you do that? So why don't we you know, target the people who are already on your doorstep, who are already passing through, and encourage them to come in, create experiences for a day, a unique thing they can do in Tallinn for the day. Uh, and it's about unleashing your imagination, really. As an economy, you're ranked as an innovation follower, which isn't bad compared to who you're being compared to. So you're not considered an innovation leader and everything, but you are ranked quite highly. So we know you have the capability. And we know that your competitiveness is improving on travel and tourism. As we heard, you're in the top quarter in the world on the competitiveness of your offering. Uh, on price, you're in the top half in the world tourism rankings. In terms of infrastructure, you're ranked 11th. In terms of hotels, I think you're ranked 14th. That is a fantastic story to tell when you think about who you're up against. That's about what you've already got, not about investing in new stuff. And then economically, we know that the country's doing brilliantly. 33rd in terms of overall competitiveness. Uh, 30th in terms of the business environment. 23rd in terms of innovation. Why is this important? Well, I think the biggest opportunity for you at the moment is the smaller of your two segments. Today, the bulk of your focus is on leisure tourism, and about a quarter is business tourism. And we heard earlier, should we build a convention center to grow that? No. Use what you've got. The, 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 the meetings industry has a lot of big events, 500 people plus. 
But the massive part of the meetings industry, the biggest part, is events of 500 or less. A lot of corporate events, a lot of people coming from the emerging markets to grow into Europe, having their corporate conferences somewhere, using that corporate conference as a place to learn about a destination. Uh, a lot of new associations, a lot of small associations, a lot of spin-outs and specialist focus. One of the big things coming out of some research we're doing at the moment on the future of corporate and association events is this idea of specialising more, becoming more and more focused on particular interest groups, which means smaller meetings in cheaper destinations. It's very clear. The other thing people want is flexibility. They don't want to be bound by the rules of a convention centre and which rooms you can have. Why? Because more and more of the meeting is being designed when people get there. The delegates get to the meeting and talk about the topics they want to discuss. The breakout groups might be five people, they might be a hundred. So they want the space to work for them. The two best venues I've ever had meetings in, or conferences in, one was in a marquee, a tent in Stockholm, a thousand people in one tent. When it came to the breakouts, you had five screens around the room. People stayed at their round tables. They just turned to look at whichever screen they were interested in and listened through headphones to the different speakers. People loved it. You didn't have all that time moving to and from breakouts. The other one that I thought was fantastic was just a big warehouse space in Copenhagen. One day it's an art gallery. The next day it's being used for a conference. The next day someone might be having an exhibition in there. But it's a very basic space, but what people love is the flexibility and the feel of originality about it. You have plenty of spaces right now. Who I would be targeting are those high-end business conferences in the sectors of the future. You know, nanotech, optronics, the next generations of biotech. These are relatively small, many of these associations and conferences, a couple of hundred people, but they're high-end, they're investors, they're companies, they're researchers. They're looking for a unique place. They're looking for more than just a conference room. They want to do it somewhere different. They want to do it in a castle. They want to do it in an open-air museum. They want to experience it. And guess what? A lot of them would love not to stay in a hotel where they could be anywhere in the world. They actually want to experience the unique culture. Do you know who has the most rooms? Which group has the most ho bedrooms available on the internet today for you to rent overnight? Anyone know? Hilton, Marriott, have a guess. Come on, it's the audience participant. Hey? Close. It's a company called Airbnb, where you and I can let out our bedroom on a per night or per week basis. They now have more rooms, almost a million rooms available around the world. You, if you could search, I forgot to get the numbers. I looked last night, but there are people in Tallinn offering rooms available. Think about partnering with them for your conventions. So you can build into the proposition for someone that when you come, you'll come to the convention, we're actually going to hold it in a school, we're going to visit people in some very interesting tech and science sectors in Estonia, you're going to eat in these great places, and by the way, you'll stay in someone's home. How much more of a cultural experience is that than some of the kind of normal things where you do it in a convention centre and you stay in a hotel and you could be anywhere in the world. Now, yesterday morning I spoke in Bucharest. I could have been anywhere. You know, where was I? I was basically on planet Radisson. And I could have been anywhere in the world. The food I ate, the, the meeting room, the bedroom, I saw nothing of Bucharest. I got no experience of it. Even if I'd just spent that one night with a local, it would have changed my view. So I'm now more and more saying I'm going to book my nights through Airbnb just to get the local experience. So there's all sorts of things you do that re don't require investment, but that actually make your proposition really exciting. And what's going to attract people here is the fact that this is a great business environment. So particularly if you're trying to attract people from developing markets who are trying to understand Europe, they might be willing to come because they can also learn about the local economy and start to look at it as maybe the place where they put their headquarters or they put their product localization piece. As the economics ministry, I'm very interested in this because I'm not just interested in the tourism revenues of bringing these conventions in. What I'm most interested in is the long-term spin-off, the long-term economic impact. If you look at Sydney, Sydney is the best measurer of this. What they can show is 
the number of jobs created in key science sectors, uh, the long-term investment in infrastructure that comes out of having key events. And they have a very clear pattern. They have identified about a thousand events around the world that are in the key sectors that are part of the National Economic Development Plan, the key sectors that Australia wants to grow, biotech, green tech, and they go after those events because then they can connect the people coming from the event to the local community and they end up building relationships, knowledge networks, investment, research opportunities. They have generated nearly half a billion dollars of economic value through those conferences that's long term, that's not just about hotel nights. They can point to a $50 million AIDS research center that was built as a result of people having a conference there. For me as the economics ministry, that is a massive opportunity that if I invest in promoting us as a conference destination and bringing people in, there's a big multiplier event. I can put my local students and my local business businesses in that sector. Let's say it's in telephony, in security. By connecting them with the global security community, I'm accelerating their development, I'm creating opportunities for them, I'm having a multiplier. We need to think about pulling things together and thinking about this in a very different way than simply the pure tourism benefits. The meetings industry drives that. And if you bring people here for business events, they come, they see what you've got, then they're very likely to come back as a tourist if they like what they see. And then they'll bring their families and their friends. Sorry. Um, and you have got some great innovations. You know, the, I told various stories to my friends over the last few days about what we see going on here from our research. The number one thing they all said they loved to come and visit was the KGB Museum. They said they would come here just for that. Think about that, you know, wrapping experiences around what you already have, promoting what you have. I bet out there, there is probably at least two or three million people around the world who are interested in the KGB and the secret services. And to create, you know, to approach those associations, those book clubs, those communities and say, why don't we create a holiday for you? Come here. They're not going to be worried about whether they have to take two flights to come and see the KGB museum. They're going to come. And you can create the experience with them. And maybe every two years they have an event here and they'll build it up with you. And you see that happening now. Destinations building with the communities, their event. The community feels like they own the event, but they're working with the destination your marketing costs become almost zero because the community does the marketing. Your product development costs are almost zero because the community tells you what else they'd like to do. Your job is just to keep servicing them, giving them new ideas, telling them what, what's the best time of year to come, what's the cheapest time, creating the experience for them. Uh, you've got a fantastic sustainable proposition. Again, when I talked to my friends, we'd had a lot to drink, by the way, when I told them about this, but they thought, what a fantastic way to come. Instead of going on a stag weekend, you know, do the trip skating, do the outdoor canoe dugout building, uh, do the bog shoeing. You've got a great way, you know, set of resources on the web to promote this stuff. People will come for that. Build these things into the, you know, the proposition for when people come for their business events. These are really attractive propositions that people will come for what you've already got. Uh, and you've got some interesting stuff going on around partnership. You know, you've got this deal going with Turku, this sort of trying to promote yourselves as a joint destination. I think it's a great idea. Partnering with other local cities. So people may say, I don't want to come for a week here, but I'll come for three or four days. That's something you don't need government to get involved in. You can do it at a hotel to hotel level. You as a travel agent can connect with a travel agent there and put a package together between you. You don't need people to come and tell you how to do this stuff. It's in there. So what about the opportunities? What are some of the things you can do to drive the agenda? Well, one is you have to get the community to want this and own it. Best example I've seen of this is Aruba, where they said, look, you know, what should we do about tourism? We can go mass market, we can be cheap, we can have US students come for spring break, you know, drink a lot, smash the place up, or you know, where do you want to go? And what they said is, we don't want tourists to ruin our country. We want to enjoy the tourists that come, we want them to enjoy us. So let's develop our proposition in a way that targets people who want to come and appreciate what we have in our culture, rather than just sell the, play, the fact that we're hot and you can have cheap booze. 
And so the whole community has got behind that experience. And obviously, it's a key employer there. But they opened up to the community to have an honest debate about what kind of tourism do we want. And if we didn't have tourism, what else would we do? And I think you have to do that. You have to get the community to realize that this is a very important part of what you've got. Particularly to realize that it's a way of growing the economy because it's bringing people, particularly on the business side, who then might invest in your economy and help grow your economy and create jobs and help fund the education that keeps you a viable and vibrant economy. Uh, some people are actually selling their change process. So Malmo, as you know, went through a massive regeneration after industrial decline in the 90s. They actually built a tourism proposition around come and see us regenerate. Come and see what happens when a city decides a new industrial plan. And they decided their plan was about green development, a massive expansion of the education sector to create industries of the future. But then that became something that everyone else wanted to come and visit to see how they were doing it. So they built a tourism proposition around their transformation. Uh, Berlin, much bigger place than you, but very clear. They said, what we want to do is not try and appeal to everyone. Our core proposition is that we want to appeal to young people who want the ultra hip, ultra cool experience. So we're not going to go for the most expensive hotels to start off with. We're going for youth hostels, two and three star hotels, bars, <laughs> trendy nightclubs. The best club I've been to is the one in the underground station in central Berlin. Fantastic. But we're selling that cool. And it was ran through all of their marketing. Yes, they could have marketed a million different things. And some people try. But they actually said, look, no, let's market a core proposition and put our focus on that. And let's be, have the courage to just focus on a couple of key things rather than trying to do everything. Sydney, I love. Sydney, uh, what they recognise is they have an off-season when the hotel, you know, there's, there's low, um, low demand and the same thing every year and everyone shouts at everyone else and says, you're, you know, you're responsible for filling the hotel rooms. And what they say is, look, let's, you know, let's stop doing this. Let's do something creative. And so what they did was, they, they had a number of different ideas and the one they picked was, let's invite a bunch of artists to create art exhibits in Sydney for a three-week period in the off-season and then have the artists promote through their own social networks to say, I'm exhibiting in Sydney, why don't you come? And have people come to see these art exhibits. It's, the, it's their trip. They're coming to see these unique things that won't ever be shown again because they're one-offs like the projections on the Opera House. And let's tie in with the hotels and different people. And they had one conference the first year. There was a creative conference alongside it. They're now into year five. There are six conferences running. The problem they have now is it's no longer an off-peak season because they have these six conferences running. The place is so popular. It started off with some proper support from the, the tourism agency, but their goal was to make it self-sufficient, that they didn't need to do it. The biggest challenge they had was getting the hotels to tell people about what else they could see, to, to, to give them the leaflets to explain how to visit the art exhibits, to suggest where they might eat. It was just a little bit of training to get the hotels to become part of the process and to really engage in it and see the value of it. Now it's a fantastic thing that everyone's proud of it. When you get there, it's the first thing they talk to you about when you check in. It's now self-sustaining. It it's become a feature of the city. It's just like you know, having a festival that's theirs. Uh, Adelaide, different challenge. They have a convention centre. We're working with them about you know, how do you use all our research to, to create the modern convention centre. Uh, and our challenge is about telling them to put less things in and be more flexible than put lots more stuff in. But the interesting thing they have is that they have a festival, an arts and theatre festival in Adelaide every year. And when that's on, there isn't a single hotel room available in the city. So no one wants to run a convention during that period because you can't have any delegates come. So you have this big convention centre that's basically empty for two weeks, which is very expensive. So they said, no, what we've got to do is to start to create things that are sustainable. And so what they did was they set up a, 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 a basically what they called a cellar door festival. All around, Sydney, uh, all around Adelaide are vineyards where you can go and try, try wine from the Adelaide Hills and Bungaroo and places. And what they basically did was persuade those people to come and have a stand in the exhibition centre. Because if you want to go wine tasting, it, when you go wine tasting there, you don't have one sip and throw the rest away, you drink the whole glass. So after two wine tastings, you can't drive anymore. 
So you have to hire a driver. You have to take the whole of the day, basically, to go wine tasting. So it's an expensive and long process. So they said, let's bring these guys into the city, charge you $20 to visit, and you can have as many tastings as you want and one full glass of wine. Absolutely phenomenal response. What they hadn't expected was that people were coming from the festival here, paying the $20 to come in and drink, because it was actually cheaper than buying drinks at the festival. People from the city were coming in, they could come by a taxi, much cheaper than going out, you know, 40 miles out of the city, or 40 kilometers, and were coming in for a couple of hours. Phenomenal impact for the, the local uh, wine growers in terms of sales. Literally every single one of them uh, booked for the following year on the spot, and just said, we want to be here. And uh, it's, be it's going to become a permanent feature now of the city. It's going to become part of the festival. And it's something that's sustainable because it's built with the local community, it's done in downtime, and it's something that grows and grows and grows, and it's a benefit to everyone. Uh, I talked about business events. I think you know, this is a real opportunity for you guys now to think very differently. Not say, let's build big new centres. You know, maybe what you do is say, OK, if we've got some money, let's have a competition for people to create a pop-up convention centre. Many of you will have seen the Moville pop-up hotels. Uh, it's, a, it's a mobile hotel. Uh, it costs about 400,000 euros to buy one, but it's on the back of a truck. But more and more, you're seeing these rapid construction techniques. In China, recently, they built a whole nine-story hotel, sorry, a 15-story hotel in six days. After they laid the foundation, they built this hotel in six days. It can withstand a factor nine earthquake. It uses a fraction of the energy you would normally use, and it costs about 80% of what it would normally cost to build that. They're building 15 more in China and 30 more around the world. You know, if you're going to do it, do it a different way. Create something that's a, a flexible, like Lego, convention facility that can be put up quickly and moved around the country. So if someone wants to come, you've got this facility that you can say, well, we'll put your convention center wherever you need it to be. So if you want to be by the seaside or you want to be out there bog shoeing, we'll take your convention center to you. That's a sustainable resource that keeps going. Invest in smart solutions. Uh, and you can really grow it. You know, sell what you have as the destination for conventions. Go for those smaller to medium-sized events, up to 500. There are many more of those, and those people don't have the market power to demand big payments from you for them to come. That's the market space I would go for. You know, building in the homestay, building in all sorts of options. That's sustainable, because that's using what you've got. People want cheaper facilities. The biggest thing they want... <coughs> In our survey running right now, the biggest requirement is for free Wi-Fi. Oh my, where would I do that? <laughs> Ranked second in the world as a country in terms of internet access. Seventh in terms of being an intelligent community, in terms of being wired. Those are really powerful attractions for conference communities. Market what you've got. Uh, the social media, you're going to hear a lot about social media, but this is now a really powerful tool for shifting capacity. Uh, Joie de Vivre, a chain in the, in the US, twice a week they make a special offer, once on Facebook and once on Twitter. If you sign up to follow them, you'll receive this special offer. And basically the hotel says, here's our spare capacity this weekend or in the next three days. You have two hours to sign up and take this big discount. Now who they're selling to is not the same customers who would book at rack rate. They're booking students and, and couples and people who are saying, okay, yeah, I'll take advantage of that offer. I'll do something I wouldn't otherwise have done. I'll treat myself. And what you know is if I don't sell an empty hotel room tomorrow night, I can't sell it again. I can't get back the revenue I lose tomorrow night. Whatever else I do, I can't resell that room. It's not like having a can of baked beans that if I don't sell it today, I can sell it tomorrow. I cannot sell an empty hotel room on the 29th of September on the 30th. So using the social media is becoming a really powerful mechanism now. You're seeing people use things like Groupon, these aggregator sites, to say if enough people book, we'll give you a big discount. In the US now, there's a university in Chicago selling courses through Groupon. If enough people book, they get the course at a 60% discount. There's no risk, because what they're saying is there's a certain number of people we need at a certain price, to run the course. If we get that, we'll run it. If we don't, we won't. You can do exactly the same. You can say, okay, we've got a weekend when we're very empty. I either don't have the staff in and everything, or if I get a certain number of people book, 
at a certain price, then it's worth me doing it. I can bring them in. They'll spend more on food and beverage. It's going to work for me. This is all stuff you can do yourselves with the social media. Uh, agritourism is a growing thing. In India, the farmers now have seen agritourism as a huge way of boosting their income, selling the fact that you can stay on a local farm, not trying to sell something different, selling what you can do there, selling the experience you can have there. Uh, you're going to talk a lot more about market targeting. I, I would not invest a lot of money in going after geographic markets. It's a fool's errand. I wouldn't be paying for adverts on CNN or you know, the BBC Worldwide to say, come to Estonia. I would want them to come and film you and say, uh, here's what you can do in Estonia. Here are the cool experiences you can have there. That's much more powerful than paying for adverts. You've got, you know, I would, as part of that, I would be leveraging the assets you've got. You know, it's a huge opportunity here. What are you doing around the cultural capital? What, are, what things are you creating during the, culture, the capital of culture that will live on, that are sustainable, that are events that will live here, that are relationships between different parts of the community that will live here? What are you doing between hotels and museums to create unique experiences, whether it's your science museum or whatever? You know, targeting schools to say, why don't you come during the school vacation, see our science museum, here's what we've got. You know, the, universe, the, the schools, the, sorry, the hotels and the museums partnering to create unique experiences. You've got one in here, but it's very easy to do. Just sit down together, create a proposition. And the great thing is the social media now enables you to target exactly the community who would be interested in that. You don't have to just put the offer up and hope. You can go into that community and say, you know, if we were to offer a holiday coming here to do in the science museum, what would you like to do when you come? What new experiments would you like to try when you come to the science museum? What would you always love to do that you never got a chance to do as a scientist, as a kid? Create experiences that are memorable, that people can have a story to tell. Art. Uh, I've been to a number of hotels now where they're building in art exhibits from local artists and marketing that to say, come stay at our hotel and see the art. Or come visit our city. So Adelaide did this, where you could go around and visit a number of different artists' work in different hotels and different galleries and shops, but basically it was sold as a trip. Come visit and come on an art experience. Well, I'm not selling that to people who want to come on a stag weekend. I'm selling that to art lovers, and I'm selling that as something that you can never do again. That that work that those artists are exhibiting this year, you'll never see again, because it will be sold. What you see next year will be different. You're selling something truly unique. Uh, you know, sell the high-tech piece you've got here. You've got a fantastic high-tech story. Sell the opportunity to connect with these people who are changing the world. Medical tourism, you've got some great medical facilities here. That is a market that, where, again, the hotels and the, the travel agents and the hospitals can get together and create propositions. And you can go in and target these to the communities that are most interested. You know, where have you got an advantage? Um, gourmet dining, everyone wants to eat good food. Everyone wants to try unique local food. Creating those gourmet packages, again, with the restaurants, the hotels, add in the art exhibit and say, come. And again, we'll have a unique set of experiences for you. Come for a three-day trip. Each meal you have will be created by a different chef at a different location. And they promise that they'll never serve that food again. So you've got a story to tell. You've got something that lives on, something that they'll write about in the social media, and then everyone will want to come next year because they'll have their own unique story. Distinctive experiences. Again, my friends, again, we'd had a lot more to drink before I told them about this one. But this, you know, this place you can go where it floods. They said, how cool would that be to go and stay and you know, have a trip, visit these flooded places and actually have an experience out of it and maybe even help with the clear up or whatever. You know, sell it as an experience, sell the opportunity. Everything I've told you, everything I've suggested requires us to move away from centrally planned, centrally managed, big investments to opening up your imagination, to giving yourselves permission to be creative, to giving yourselves permission to partner. You're going to hear a lot more about social media this afternoon. You could literally, in the lunch break today, go and set up a Twitter site for your business, it takes about 20 seconds, and make an offer. No one responds, it's cost you nothing. You might get a couple of people come. These things can be tested and developed very quickly. And what we have to do is to recognize that we can't have perfect plans for everything. We can't have five-year plans for everything we're going to do. We don't know how the world's going to play out. There are many scenarios for what the economy could look like. What we have to do, and the big investment we have to make as an industry, 
is developing managers and leaders who are actually tolerant of uncertainty, who are willing to think about plan A, plan B, plan C, who are willing to try new ideas, not blame someone else if it fails. We've also got to think about partnership. Partnerships between you. Again, what, what the tourism agencies here should be doing is facilitating the partnerships, I think. That's the sustainable piece. Facilitating the space for you to come together. Training you in how to do social media so you can create opportunities together. Teaching you how to be magnetic, how to go out there and contribute to the social media so people like what you've got and will actually come back to you and say, hey, listen, I've got a management team who are creating a revolutionary new car. Uh, I want an experience. What could you do for me? You know, who are going to bring opportunity to you rather than you having to sell it all the time? And that's about you presenting what you have and your creativity and being magnetic in your behavior. I think the world we're moving into is one where there is huge opportunity for those who are willing to accept it. For those who are willing to accept that success lies in our hands, not in someone else spending money on our behalf. That actually the best way of making the industry successful is getting the industry to be successful. Investing in the industry and capability, you know, by all means spend money on a training school, a hotel and tourism training school. If you're an airline, you know, what would I be doing now to raise money? Yeah, I could ask government. But what I would really do is look around the world and see that there are lots of airlines who would love what I have, which is flexibility, smart management, and a high-tech culture. Because what they're trying to do is to transform their airline, whether they're trying to put broadband into the plane, new services, change the passenger experience, ticketless check-in. The problem is if I'm British Airways or I'm American Airlines, I've got Everyone has an idea. Everyone has to agree. It takes me forever to make any change. Actually, what I need is a skunk works, is an innovation center, who I can give the ideas to, or who can, I can give the license to come up with ideas, test them out, implement them quickly, if, and then I learn from those, and then I implement them. You see it happening in other sectors. Coca-Cola has a stake in Innocent Drinks for exactly that reason. Many of you may know Innocent Smoothies. Very funky, cool organization. Totally different culture to Coke. Coke is not allowed to interfere at all. They can't send the men in grey suits to tell them how to do it. These guys do what they want. Coke will ask them ideas, say, can you try a new concept for this? But they leave them to do it. I would change my mindset about who I want to invest. I would be looking for airlines that see, as a partner, who actually want to invest in me as an innovation center. The same for my airport. How I would put myself on the map is by going after the awards of being the best small airline and the best small airport in Europe. Best small airport in Europe last year was Reykjavik. The great thing is only small airports can compete, so you're in a perfect space. It's very doable. I love the airport experience here. The other thing I would be doing is building brand ambassadors, building people who are Estonians, out in the rest of the world who are willing to talk about what you have here and encouraging the people who do come here and visit to then go and talk to the rest of the world about what they've experienced because that's the most powerful marketing. That's the most sustainable piece of marketing. Encourage them to post on their social communities. Encourage them to talk about their experiences. Encourage them to give you feedback. Everything I've talked about as well is not about doing it yourself. It's about partnerships, partnerships between hotels, restaurants, and museums, between art galleries and people, between leisure experiences and, and business experiences, between schools, restaurants, and hotels, and people's homes to create a business conference. Partnership is a very sustainable model because everyone's invested in the success. It does mean being curious about new ideas and being magnetic in your behavior, encouraging people to come to you. And most important, it's recognizing that there are no guarantees of success. Talking about an idea, commissioning consultants to come up with the idea for you isn't the way forward. Trying stuff quickly, having lots of ideas, trying a few, seeing what works, refining it does work. Why do I say having the consultants doesn't work? Because the classic model is you say, okay, we want to grow our tourism industry or we want to grow our meetings industry. So we, we give a lot of money to the consultants and we say, tell us how to grow the meetings industry. Well, they're not going to say, use homestay, use schools, use marquees, have events in their things, because that doesn't help them. 
in order to justify their big fee, they're going to say, build a convention center, go after the biggest events in the world. And then they're going to ask you to do a feasibility study to make that happen, blah, 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 blah. So it's a reinforcing thing. In all that time, you're not actually moving forward. You're just waiting on the study. Then you're waiting on the building. And even when the building's there, nothing's happening because there's no people in it. Then you've got to do the marketing. The other way is to say, no, let's experiment. Let's try a range of other things. Let's see if we can grow these things without those big investments. But just by being creative and doing things more imaginatively and going after the people who would come. And if that works, fantastic. If it doesn't, then we can refine it and keep moving. So I hope I've given you a few ideas. That was my main goal today, was A, to try and inspire you to believe that the future is in your hands, no one else's, and to give you some ideas of things you can do with almost no investment, other than your time, your emotion, and your energy. Thank you. I hope you have a fantastic future. Anyway, you, you said there's no point to have advertisement uh, in like BBC or, or mass media. Uh, what do you think? There's no if... point paying for it. Okay, no point paying for it, okay, to invest money. But uh, what about having an uh, attractive movie made in Estonia? And I've heard that some countries say that it's uh, worth uh, many, uh, many different mass, me mass media campaigns the money you have to invest. Right. So it works really well for, for the destination country because it tells stories. What is your experience? Well, one you. thing you have to remember about the human condition is that someone who spends money on an investment very rarely says that investment was unsuccessful. So if I've spent 25 million euros to get a film crew to come make a film in my city, I will find a way of proving that that 25 million was well spent. And if a McDonald's opens up in my city in the next 10 years after that film was made here, I'll say that that was because of the film. It, it's very hard to decouple it. That was a great idea after Lord of the Rings uh, because it sold New, New Zealand fantastically. But I don't know that it's the way I would go because you're taking a very big risk up front to get the right film. You're taking a very big risk that they'll make a good film. And you're taking a very good risk, a big risk that this film will be successful and an even bigger risk that the people who watch that film will then want to come to the country it was filmed in. That's a lot of ifs. Uh, I work with a lot of investors, so generally if I suggest that, I'm already out of the door. <laughs> it's kind of, they don't see that as a good investment proposition. What I would be doing is a different model. I would say, let's create something interesting where what we're creating is a story in itself. So say, hey, we have got these fantastic natural experiences you can have here. Dugout canoe building, bog shoeing, skiing, all those things. What we want is for people to come and make a film, a student film festival, about the extreme outdoor experience here. What we'll give you is free hotel and a free flight to come. You make the film, you promote it on YouTube, we'll, we'll have a platform on YouTube, we'll promote it through Skype, and the winning prize, will, you know, the winning film that everyone votes for, we'll give a prize to. Much faster impact, much broader impact, and a community that's, all, you know, that's promoting it all the way through. What you're doing becomes a story. Uh, open innovation is a fantastic way to go to create these propositions and open contests. Everything that requires a big ticket investment up front requires a huge amount of argument and debate and everyone to discuss it and takes a long time to agree. And then there's a huge pressure to try and make it a success, whether it would have been or not. It distorts everything. Um, I see countries being ripped apart by these big investment projects that are hope. Uh, the, the best one for me at the moment is Belfast. Belfast decided that their big tourism investment project was built to build a museum dedicated to the Titanic. Right, you all know the Titanic, the film? Yeah? What happened to the Titanic? The bloody thing sank. You are building a testimony to something that died, that was a disaster. Now, they're celebrating it because it was built in the shipyard there. And this year is its anniversary of being built. 
But after that, who's going to come to this giant museum just because of a ship that sank? You know, a few people, but not a big enough community to warrant the hundreds of millions of euros spent on this thing. What I would have done was create a mobile exhibition that was on the back of a truck that I could take around Europe and the world and show people and then use that to encourage people to come back to Ireland. I think you're going to go for creative and smart things that are sustainable. And next year, I put a different exhibition on that truck and take it around again. Okay, uh, my name is Tiana Baudel and I'm from Hotel Jingle. But you talked a lot of about our strong sides. Tens place, 30, third place. But what are, in your opinion, two, three weakest points that we should overcome before we get fast growth? Because I don't think that we are only strong in every side. You know your weaknesses, I don't. I mean, I haven't stayed in every property. Um, what I'm saying is play on those strengths. It's easier to develop propositions. If I'm going out to an association, let's say I'm going to uh, uh, people whose hobby is road, you know, studying roads. I can go to that association and say, look, I've got this really cool road museum. Why don't you come and have a conference here or you know, an event here for your association members? And by the way, we have a really good tourism proposition. Look, look, look where we rank, look at the facilities. So I would be selling the strength. Internally, you guys need to then get the feedback from those people who come about what doesn't work for them. I don't know. I mean, if, if the hotel GM here wanted to sit down and buy me a coffee... I would very happily tell him what I like about the hotel or her, what I like, and what I would improve. I'm not going to publicise either of those in this room because of the competitors here, and, you know, it's not fair. But, you know, everywhere I go, I'll make that offer. That's what you should be doing, is asking your customers. You should be telling me what weaknesses you're now inspired to challenge as a result of hearing what I've said. Because the solution is all in your hands. Okay. If I say, fix this thing, you'll go, fix this thing. And if it doesn't work, then you'll come and beat me up. Okay, it's my personal opinion, but I just think that Estonian people, by, they are not so cooperative. We like competition. It's all what you are talking about, cooperation, it is a little bit hard because we always want to be better. And right. So what I would do is recognise that the bulk of the population always wait for a few people to lead. If I was the, the tourism bureau, what I would say is, look, I'm going to give... 1,000 euros marketing to support for the first 10 people that come with a partnership proposition, you know, where they're bringing a hotel together with a leisure attraction or someone else. You come to me with the idea, I'll facilitate it. The first few who do that get the marketing support, which is great. The others will then see that working and go, oh, right, we might not get the marketing support, but what we want is the extra hotel nights, the extra revenues. Why don't we try that? Only a fool keeps banging their head against a wall and doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. You have to try some different things. And it's all in here. It's about whether you give yourselves permission to do it. You know, I spend my whole time talking to people all around the world who, you know, who all say the thing about, and then you put whatever country it is in, is we're like this. The, you know, you guys are kind of positively partnership and innovation orientated compared to the Icelanders. Yeah, you know, Iceland's culture, they, it was basically built by a bunch of kings in Iceland who were fed up of being taxed, in Norway, who were fed up of being taxed, and they just got up and said, we're leaving. Didn't know where they were going, just went. And eventually they found this island. And they, but the Icelanders' mentality is, if I want to fly somewhere, the first thing I'll do is build an airport and then I'll build an airline. You know, I won't go and see if there's one there already. I won't do anything in partnership. That doesn't work for them. They're beginning to learn the difference. What you can't do is force someone to move. You can offer incentives to people who want to try it and then use their results and their success as an enticement to the others to follow. But if someone doesn't want to open the door and let the future in, then fine. Leave them to struggle. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rohit. Uh, we have to hurry up with the new stories. Thank you so much. Thank you.